These new numerical feats enabled science, mathematics and astronomy to reach new heights in the Middle East. And the Indian troop became a smash hit throughout the Islamic world. But on the other side of the Mediterranean, Christian Europe was still in the static grip of the old army of Roman numerals. And being Romans, they weren't going to give way to the feisty newcomers that easily. A showdown between the two systems was inevitable. And when it came, it would shape the destiny of the Western world. The beginning of the end for the Roman numerals started on the shores of North Africa. Muslim traders had been quick to adopt Juan, Zero and Co for their business dealings. By the end of the 12th century, the Indian numerals were in common use. And it was in the bustling port of Bijaya that the young son of an Italian diplomat based in Algeria first witnessed their amazing act. When I had been introduced to the art of the Indian's nine symbols, knowledge of the art very soon pleased me more than anything else and I came to understand it. That young man was known as Fibonacci and he was so knocked out by the Indian numerals that when he grew up he decided to take them home. In 1202 Fibonacci wrote a book all about calculation called well, the book of calculation. He's now regarded as one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. And his book was pretty much a showcase for Indian number. Fibonacci wasn't just an ivory tower theorist. Part of his book of calculations was aimed specifically at merchants, showing them how useful Indian numerals could be for, say, calculating their profits. Not exactly a page turner, you might think, but this was a time when capitalism was beginning to come out into the open in Europe. Fibonacci's book was a must-read. Unfortunately, ordinary people felt comfortable with the old numbers. After all, they'd lived with them part of a thousand years. The old Roman numerals weren't going to make it easy for the Indian newcomers. And it wasn't just a question of tradition. Your average punter had some pretty good reasons to prefer the old system. For example, many medieval Italian cities had their own currency. So every time I found myself in a new town or a new set with extras in costumes, as the case may be, I have to go to the money changer's bench, or banker, as it's called. A banker was a counting table, basically an abacus with counters instead of beads. The men who operated them, the bankers, had to swear an oath not to cheat their customers. Mind you, if the uh, magistrates find he is cheating me, they'll come and break his bench, and his banker will be rupta, which is the word for broken. And he'll be declared banker rupta, which is where we get the word bankrupt from. Hi. Now, these things, how much can I get those in whatever place this is? He's counting it now. It's uh, reassuring to see he's using numerals I'm familiar with, uh, which are Roman numerals, of course. And he's using this abacus, so at least I can see what he's doing. And I get that much. Oh, right, fine. Well, thanks a lot. Nice doing business with you. <laughs> but what if I was to go over to one of the smart chaps using the newfangled Indian numerals? Hi. Now, uh, how much would you give me for that? Now, you see, this is the problem. You see, as a medieval punter, I've got no idea what he's writing. I mean, no wonder people were suspicious. I mean, if my bank started keeping my accounts in Chinese, I'd be suspicious. Oh, thanks. I've got no idea how you arrived at that. But thanks anyway. This distrust went right to the top. 
in 1299, the city of Florence actually banned merchants from using the new numbers in accounts. They had to use Roman numerals. But no number was treated with more suspicion than one's partner, Zero. One writer called Zero a sign which creates confusion and difficulties. <laughs> Zero was called Sifra, and it was regarded with such suspicion that that word became our word for secret code, a cipher. But the days of the old system were numbered. I suppose you could blame good old human greed. The traditionalists who clung to the abacus and Roman numerals had never had to calculate interests on loans because the Catholic Church said charging interests on loans was a sin. It was called usury. But come the Reformation, the Protestant churches were more business friendly and the long-held Christian objections to capitalism seemed to, well, disappear. So, in this new money-lending, interest-charging environment, which would prove the more useful? Indian numbers or the abacus? Well, let's find out. On my right, one first-class mathematician. On my left, one first-class abacist. So, supposing I lend someone £10 at half a percent interest a month, how much do they owe me at the end of the year. Okay? Ready? Steady? Go! Kimmy's been an abbasist since she was just 15 and is using a modern Soroban model. But just as they did in the 16th century, she's rounding her numbers to the nearest penny as she goes. Let's hope she can round herself up into first place. Marcus is using a pen and paper, so he's working to an eye-popping 12 decimal places. He lives in North London with his lovely wife Shani and three charming children. He's not big, but he is clever. Ah, the Kimmy has got an answer. Kimmy, yes. what, what's your answer? £10.60. £10.60. Yes. So compound interest after a year would be £10.60 and the abacus seems to have got there before the mathematician. Well, I don't want to put a damper on things, but I think that answer is actually wrong. Um, I've got uh, an answer of £10.61.677766403535. pence to be yeah. precise. I've actually picked up the subtlety of compound interest, which is, it's a little bit each month, but it adds up, so I've got this extra 1.67p. For the medieval businessman, it would mean the difference between making a living and not. Maybe that's why the abacus user looks so miserable. As capitalism gained respectability, calculating interest and compound interest became de rigueur for any self-respecting businessman. And for doing that, even with an abacus, the old Roman system was simply no match for the Indian numerals. So, centuries after Fibonacci had brought them to Europe, the Indian numbers finally outmaneuvered the lumbering old Romans. They were quick and versatile, and with one and zero in the lead, just better at teamwork. When the end came, it was a pushover. The old Roman numerals were at last banker rupta. But one and zero had even bigger plans for the future, and they didn't include the other numerals. In the meantime, the full troop of Indian numbers took over the Western world. With them, European navigators found it easier to calculate their latitude and so dared to cross the great ocean out of sight of land. That's how they stumbled on America. And the new numbers became the vocabulary of modern banking as we know. But there was still plenty of room for that old problem, human error. Columbus thought he'd got to Japan, when in fact he'd got to the West Indies, half the world away. He'd made a mistake. Humans do. 
which was something one man was determined to stop.